Jean Pellegrin is joining us. He's starting in France. The uh, Prime Minister, Michel Barnier, expected to present his budget plan to the Cabinet later. Uh, what's the goal here then, Michel? Well, the goal here is uh, twofold, Stuart. First, reducing France's steep public deficit, uh, meaning the gap between how much it spends and how much uh, it collects. Second, keeping its level of debt in check, all within an extremely precarious French political context with no clear majority in Parliament. In terms of deficit, the objective is to reduce it from 6.1% of GDP this year to 5% in 2025, and finally, uh, 3% in 2029, which uh, is the level agreed to in European commitments. In terms of debt, since Emmanuel Macron took over as president in 2017, Fr France added over a trillion euros to its debt pile with a series of crises and disappointing revenue levels, bringing it to about 112% of GDP. That's almost twice as much as what, it recommend, what is recommended by the EU, 60% which is the final objective that France aspires to reach. Mm. What's the stake here then for France? Well, the simple answer here is its credibility on financial markets. The state of France's public accounts has a direct effect on its ability uh, uh, to borrow money. A balanced budget allows a country to issue bonds with attractive rates. For a long time, France's debt was considered to be on the level with Germany's. But with the political turmoil in the country in the past few months, France now borrows money at rates closer to those of Spain or Italy. Looking at the 10-year uh, bond, as you can see there, a year ago, that yield on that bond was of uh, around 2.5%. It's now currently over 3%, reaching a peak of over 3.3% around the time Macron called for snap parliamentary elections. This goes to show that political deadlock and uncertainty are hurting France's financial position, especially because interest rate payments are such a big part of government expenditure, only second to education. Also worth noting that the world's leading credit rating agencies will be sharing their assessment on French debt in the coming weeks, starting with uh, Fitch ratings on Friday. So what's the plan then? Presumably the government has one? It's, uh, it's planning on finding uh, 60 billion euros to plug that public deficit for 2025. 40 billion of which will come from spending cuts, which will come in a whole variety of ways. Two examples. Delaying the indexing of pensions on inflation from January to July could bring in 4 billion euros and reducing the number of government workers by not replacing those who retire. 20 billion euros will come from tax increases. Two examples here as well. The Barnier government is planning on exceptionally raising the corporate tax rate on the country's 300 biggest companies and a similar surtax will be applied to the country's 65,000 wealthiest households. The political maneuvering on this will begin as early as Friday, when Parliament's Finance Commission will start debating the plan. What's certain is that the Barnier government will be walking a tightrope, pressured on one side by the political demands of Parliament's disparate voices, and on the other side by the demands of financial markets. Yeah, a lot more on that to come later on France 24. Let's have a look at the markets then, Charles. What are they mm -hmm. doing? Uh, well, European bourses uh, opening this uh, Thursday uh, mixed uh, as investors await new inflation data out of the U.S. with the expectation that prices will continue to ease there, thereby comforting the U.S. Federal Reserve and its policy of lowering interest rates. Now a look back at the life of one of India's most successful businessmen. Mm -hmm. Ratan Tata has died at the age of 86. He was the chairman and CEO of the Indian conglomerate Tata Group, whose annual revenues exceed $100 billion. Among the seven global companies it owns uh, are uh, Jaguar Land Rover and Tetley Tees. Liza Kamenoff has this. He was one of India's most admired business titans who transformed his family business Tata Sons into a multinational corporation. Born in 1937 in Mumbai, Ratan Tata grew up in a wealthy family and studied in the United States. After graduating from Cornell University with an architecture degree, he returned to India to join the family business in 1962. Ratan began working on the shop floor of one of its companies, Tata Steel, and slowly rose up the corporate ladder. In 1991, he succeeded his uncle J.R.D. Tata as chairman of the group. Under his leadership, the conglomerate built an empire of 30 companies across multiple sectors, operating in over 100 countries. The group also made bold acquisitions of celebrated British brands in the 2000s, like Tetley T for $423 million, and car makers Jaguar and Land Rover. The Tata Group also pioneered commercial aviation, launching its airline in 1932, which later became Air India. 
In 2021, it bought Air India from the government and merged it with Vistara, another carrier which it had founded. In 2009, Tata even launched what it called the world's cheapest car, the Tata Nano, produced at low cost and marketed as affordable for everyone. But due to low sales of the car, production was discontinued. Behind the scenes, Ratan Tata was a licensed pilot, occasionally indulging in flying planes, and presented himself as leading a modest lifestyle, engaging in philanthropic work. His death sparked reactions from world leaders and other business tycoons, with Prime Minister Modi praising Ratan Tata as a visionary leader. The Google CEO Sundar Pichai saying he left behind an extraordinary business and philanthropic legacy, and even the chairman of one of the Tata Group's competitors, Reliance Industries, said Tata's passing away was a big loss to every Indian. Just a quick correction, there aren't seven global companies that belong to Tata Group. There's uh, Tata companies in seven different sectors around the, the world economy. Good correction there from Michelle Pellegrin.